All right, so we're Heaven Bible Study Part 64. And tonight we're going to start looking at 1 Chronicles. It's going to be broken up into two pieces, and then we'll get into 2 Chronicles, and we'll be through with the Old Testament. It seemed like that day was never going to come, <laughs> but it's almost here. Our previous lesson, we did a look at the book of Nehemiah. And we saw that heaven is God's dwelling place, that heaven was created by God, that the temple was God's dwelling place on earth, we saw that God is sovereign, that followers of God repent, they obey, and they fear God, and they must be purified, they must be made holy. And we also saw that God is a just judge, and He is ready to pardon, He is gracious. He is merciful, slow to anger, and abundant in kindness. And what a fantastic way to end Nehemiah, remembering who God is and why we can approach Him, why we can be saved. So our heaven definition through this study is heaven is a spiritual realm where the greatest intensity of God's presence dwells eternally. It is a holy place because God is there. It is where God rules from His throne in the heavenly temple, with the resurrected Jesus at his right hand, holy angels and the souls of the redeemed, those that have been forgiven by grace through faith, live in heaven. Satan currently has access to the heavenly courtroom and accuses the saints daily. One day Satan will be cast out of the heavenly courtroom forever. The souls of the redeemed saints will be reunited with resurrected and glorified bodies and will dwell on earth with Jesus for a thousand years. After the millennium, God will create a new universe and earth. Heaven will come down to earth, and the redeemed will live forever with God in a glorified body on the new earth. So if you would turn with me to page 4 tonight, we're going to be doing a survey of 1 Chronicles of chapters 1 through 16 tonight. So 1 Chronicles, as you read it, you probably notice it sounds very similar to 2 Samuel in particular. But one big difference about 1 Chronicles is that it is written after the people have returned from exile. Its Jewish tradition says that Ezra compiled 1 and 2 Chronicles, and originally it was one book, 1 and 2 Chronicles together in the Hebrew Bible. Uh, Septuagint, actually, the Greek translation divided that up, so that's where we get our 1 and 2 Chronicles today. And the title actually, Chronicles, we didn't get that until 400 A.D. with a Christian uh, father, Jerome, called it Chronicles, which is an appropriate description of Israel and the chronicle of their history up to, to this point. So they're being reminded of the covenant as they review their history. You know, they're back in the, the promised land. They have the, the temple and the walls or have been rebuilt by this point, and the people don't really have what they had before. You know, the nation is not strong like it once was. They do not have really a king at this point either. So they're looking back and thinking about, you know, what has God promised us? What has God done? And it's so important to remember what God has done. And even for us today in the church, you know, as we gather together in church and take of communion, remember what what Christ has done. As we have baptism, we remember what Christ has done. As the word is preached, we remember what Christ has done. We remember the promises of God. And we have hope, a confident expectation in the future. And certainly this is what the Jewish people desired, was a confident expectation of the future. So as we look at First Chronicles, we see that the term heaven Uh, as we've seen in really all of the Old Testament, I think, just about that heaven is sometimes used to describe the sky universe. Sometimes it's describing God's dwelling place in particular. This reference is 1 Chronicles 16, 25 through 26. It says, For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is also to be feared above all gods, for all the gods of the peoples are idols. But the Lord made the heavens. So we see the monotheistic statement here. God is the only God. And you know, sometimes you read the Old Testament, they describe these other gods almost like they are real gods. But what does he say here? The gods of the people, they're idols. They're made up. 
And here's the great distinction for the one true God. He is the one who made the heavens. As you look at many of the other people groups, Egypt's a good example. They worshipped the sun god, the, the Nile god, the wind god. On and on they had gods for all these elements. But no, the one true God is the God of the heavens and the earth. He made all things. What an important thing for them to remember as they think about God's sovereignty. You know, he made it all. Think about how powerful God is, how intelligent God is, how wise God is, and how God's hand is still on his creation. And his hands were on Israel in a very special way, just as his hands are on his people, the church today. Going a little bit further about who goes to heaven. Now, these are some themes that we have seen throughout. And the first point is that those who go to heaven are those whose sins are atoned. You know, as you, as you read through the Psalms, you see David's understanding of this and how he says that, the, who, that those that have their sins atoned or forgiven or blessed by God. And certainly when we truly understand what Christ has done for us, we, we should just be a, a people of joy, very thankful for what has been accomplished through the cross. Through the cross, and as they look at the temple as a tabernacle was set up with their sacrifices, they're continually reminded that sin equals death. Have you ever thought about just the sounds in Jerusalem? You know, in the hustle and bustle, all these animals—they're there to be killed. Probably the sound of animals being killed. Probably the smell of animals. Animals that have been slain. Animals that are being cooked. They're just a constant reminder that sin equals death. And there's also this constant reminder of a needed substitute. Now we know on this side of the cross who that substitute is. It is the Lamb of God. It is Jesus. Now this is looking back from 1 Chronicles 6 and 49. It says, But Aaron and his sons offered sacrifices on the altar of burnt offering and on the altar of incense for all the work of the most holy place. Now, if you remember in the temple, you had the holy place and then you had the most holy place or the holy of holies. And this is where the Ark of the Covenant was kept. And it's true in the tabernacle and then later in the actual temple that was built. And this is where the high priest would go once a year for the Day of Atonement. And you remember this high priest would always have to purify himself. He would have to make a sacrifice for his own sins before he could make a sacrifice for the people as well. Now Christ, as our great high priest, never sinned. No sacrifice had to be made for Christ. And he gave himself as our sacrifice. And the reason we don't repeat the Day of Atonement is because that day is done. The cross has accomplished our atonement, our forgiveness for sins. So this most, most holy place was a place where God's presence was uniquely with Israel. It was as a cloud when the Ark of the Covenant was there. And you know, again, as you think about this, this is the people coming back from exile. Was God's presence in the temple any longer? Where was the Ark of the Covenant? We don't know. It vanished when Babylon came. So, you know, they're building the temple. Well, they've got the most holy place. They've got the curtain. You think about as you get to the first century, we know the curtain is still there. They still have this day of atonement, but the ark is missing. God's presence had not returned to the temple in that special way. So the people certainly were looking to the future and they were desiring God to come back. Because you remember, why is heaven the great place it is? It's because of God's presence. And why was Israel ever blessed? It was because God's presence with them. So they're looking back to the, the good old days, I guess you could say, in First Chronicles. When Aaron and, the pre and his sons, they were offering sacrifices in the most holy place where God's presence was. And here's the reason. It says, and to make atonement for Israel according to all that Moses, the servant of God, had commanded. So the atonement for their sins, a sacrifice in place of them so they could have forgiveness. Now the blood of those bulls and goats never brought forgiveness. That's why it was repeated over and over again. It was a symbol pointing to the Lamb of God to come. But they understood sin equals death. They also understood that salvation is of the Lord. It is of Yahweh. And this is for First Chronicles 15 or 16 23 through 24. 
It says, and this is a praise, Sing to the Lord all the earth, proclaim the good news of His salvation from day to day. You know, what does the gospel mean? Good news. Why is it good news for us? We don't have to go to hell. <laughs> That's good news. God's reign has come. The kingdom. It's good news. And they understood the good news of salvation is when God was intervening in their situation. They said, all the earth, we need to proclaim the good news. We need to sing it out. We need to be people of joy. And how true is that of us as a church? We need to be people of joy. Let's not sit with frowny faces in the pews. Let's be excited about what Christ has done. It's good news, so we should praise Him for that. And verse 24, it says, Declare His glory among the nations, His wonder, wonders among all peoples. Now, what a praise from the Jewish people here. You remember the Jewish nation were always meant to be a light to the nations. You know, through Abraham, all nations would be blessed. Now, how did that come to pass? So ultimately through Christ, Jewish Messiah. But we see that always the good news was for all nations, for whosoever calleth on the name of the Lord. And even in this singing of praise in 1 Chronicles, again, it's after the exile, after they've been in Gentile lands, they still remember, declare His glory among the nations, His wonders among all the people. And what is our mission as the church? Go into all nations. Tell them the good news, for salvation is of the Lord. Now, when they think about salvation, it wasn't necessarily just salvation of their soul from hell. Certainly that was true at times, but their salvation is always thinking about God intervening on the situation and saving me from whatever it is. And you know, they had many of those memories. He saved them from Egypt. He saved them from Babylon, from Persia. He saved the people. God is the one that brings salvation, and ultimately He's the one that brings salvation of our souls. Going further in 1 Chronicles 16, 34-35, again, it's just praise. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. Stop and think about that for a moment. Where would we be at if the Lord was not good? We'd be in trouble, wouldn't we? And you know, all these pagan nations, they did not really think their gods were good. They were constantly trying to appease their gods by making sacrifices, by doing works, so that their evil gods wouldn't basically hurt them. But no, the one true God, He is good. And He goes on and says, For His mercy endures forever. What a demonstration of His goodness! His mercy endures forever. Whosoever calleth on the name of the Lord shall be saved. He will show us mercy, not giving us what we deserve. Verse 35, And say, Save us, O God of our salvation. Gather us together and deliver us from the Gentiles to give thanks to your holy name, to triumph in praise. So they're calling out for saving us. Rescue me, O God of our salvation. He's the one that brings salvation in every way that there is. And it's interesting that earlier in chapter 16, it says, declare his glory among the nations. And now they're saying, deliver us from the Gentiles. Now, what do the Gentiles in general represent? Sin. I mean, being unholy, being idol worshipers, being opposed to God. And certainly the Gentiles were not kind to the Jews. That seems to carry on, doesn't it? I mean, if you read the news right now, Jewish people have just always been attacked. And it doesn't even make sense. But we see that people have always been opposed to the Jewish people, those that God had called out as a special nation. But they're calling for God to save them. And certainly salvation is of the Lord. He, again, He rescues us from things now. But as we look to eternity, it is only salvation through Jesus Christ. That's the only way our souls can be saved. Going a little bit further, what happens when we die? Well, God takes a person's life. Now, that seems kind of like a, a, a duh statement. We're going to see that in a couple different times in this text tonight. But this is 1 Chronicles 2 and 3. So we need to remember, 
He's the giver of life, but he's also the one that takes life. So the sons of Judah were Ur, Onan, and Shelah. These three were born to him by the daughter of Shua, the Canaanitess. Ur, the firstborn of Judah, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, so he killed him. You remember sin equals death? So Ur, the firstborn of Judah. Now what's the importance of Judah? Ultimately, it's where Christ came through that line. David came through that line. But I mean, you look at Judah himself, he was not an upstanding character. And we see that really it's only in the mercy of God that any person is saved. But we see that there is a time where God is going to, to judge. So people that think they have a chance to repent before they die, they don't know that. And Ur had no other chance. He was wicked in the sight of the Lord and judgment came upon him in the sense of death immediately. So God is the one who takes a person's life and they understood that. They weren't really offended by that. But I think we live now in a time that people are offended by the thought of God killing somebody, God judging somebody's sin. Read the Bible. (laughs) That's exactly sin equals death. God is the one who is the just judge as well. Going a little bit further about death. So we've got Saul and his death. Now Saul, we know, really just ended up in a terrible end. Saul, the king that was chosen by the people. Not really chosen by God. God allowed them to have Saul, but it was the people that wanted this tall, strong man. But Saul went crazy, really. He tried to kill David over and over again, and David was anointed to be the king after Saul. But we see even though Saul really was a wicked man at the end of his days, that the Jewish people respected the bodies of individuals. So bodies should be honored. And I think that is an important point because sometimes we see a body as sort of just, you know, it's just a shell. The soul's gone. You know, it's just, just a shell. But we should respect that body. Now, why is it the Jewish people had such an understanding of respecting a body? What were they expecting in the last days? The resurrection. So they respected the bodies. They wanted to have an honorable burial. And now again on this side of the cross, we understand Jesus is the first fruits of the resurrection. We see that this belief in the resurrection that we find all the way in Job, the oldest book of the Bible, that continued on, it is a truth that Jesus has testified with his own resurrection. And we too will be resurrected one day. So we should be respectful of the bodies of the deceased because they're, they're still them too. <laughs> Their soul separated, but the soul and the body are going to be together forever one day. So this is First Chronicles 10, 8 through 14. So it happened the next day when the Philistines came to strip the slain that they found Saul and his sons fallen on Mount Gilbeah. And they stripped him and took his head and his armor and sent word throughout the land of the Philistines to proclaim the news in the temple of their idols and among the people. Then they put his armor in the temple of their gods and fastened his head in the temple of Dagon. Do you think the Philistines were respectful of bodies? No. They chopped Saul's head off and put his head in the temple of Dagon. Going further to verse 11. And when all Jabesh Gilead heard all that the Philistines had done to Saul, all the valiant men arose and took the body of Saul and the bodies of his sons, and they brought them to Jabesh and buried their bones under the tamarisk tree at Jabesh and fasted seven days. So they were people that risked their lives just to retrieve those bodies. You think about that even in war today, how people would go back to, to get the deceased, the bodies. But they were willing to risk their lives so Saul and the bodies of his sons would have an honorable burial. And they fasted seven days. Do you remember what, what is fasting always connected to? The scripture. Prayer. Yeah. They were seeking God. They were mourning. 
fasting seven days, even though this was a terrible king at his end. Verse 13, and here's why he died. So Saul died for his unfaithfulness. Yet again, we have God judging sin. He died for his unfaithfulness, which he had committed against the Lord because he did not keep the word of the Lord. God had clearly told him how he was to live his life, how he was to be the king. But Saul didn't listen to the word. He didn't keep the word of the Lord, the commandments of the Lord. And also because he consulted a medium for guidance. Do y'all remember that story? So he goes to a medium and he calls up the spirit of Samuel. And if you remember the medium, who was probably just a charlatan really, usually would trick people, was shocked <laughs> when she saw the, the soul of Samuel. And God had forbidden the people to really try to contact the dead at all, and these mediums and things of that nature. And I, I thought about that in the sense of things that are kind of approved in, in the Catholic Church. And, uh, you know, I'm not constantly trying to dig on the Catholic Church or anything, but they think they can pray to the dead. That sounds like something that God's forbidden to do. Who are we to pray to? God alone. God alone. So Saul was judged for many reasons. In verse 14, but he did not acquire the Lord. So he inquired the medium instead. He did not inquire the Lord. Therefore, he killed him. Who killed him? God did. How did Saul actually die? Do y'all remember? They didn't tell us in the beginning of this passage. Killed himself. Yeah, he killed himself. He fell on the sword, realizing that he was going to be killed soon at battle. But it doesn't say here Saul killed himself, does it? God killed him. God judged him. And it says, and turned, so God killed him and turned the kingdom over to David, the son of Jesse. So again, the people are just looking back, seeing what God is doing. You remember Saul? Saul didn't do what he was supposed to do. God judged him. And God placed the king that he had chosen, David. Going further in 1 Chronicles 7, 21 through 22, we see that mourning is, a, is appropriate. So, Zabad, his son, Shuthila, his son, and Ezra and Eliad, the men of Gath who were born in that land, killed them because they came down to take away their cattle. Then Ephraim, their father, mourned many days, and his brethren came to comfort him. Why is it that people mourn? Have you ever thought about that? Does everybody mourn in the same way? No. You know, I don't think we should really hold people to some kind of standard for mourning. You know, you lose this individual, you're supposed to mourn a certain amount of time, anything like that. All of our relationships are different. And honestly, that's the impact of, of the, the mourning. But you know, we don't have to mourn as people that have no hope, as Paul talks about. You know, for those that have died in Christ, we will see them again. We have that, that confident expectation of the future. But you know, now it is sad. Death is really a part of the fallen world, and it brings sadness. And certainly, as we've said before, the last enemy to be destroyed is death. So death brings sadness, and it was appropriate, and they came to comfort them. And we'll see another in the second half of uh, First Chronicles talking about comforting that doesn't go quite as well as this case, but it's appropriate mourn you know death death is a sadness of the fallen world that we really we live in now going a little bit further this is something we talked about recently but what is heaven like there is an army there and we get this from the title of god in first chronicles 11 and 9 so david went on and became great and the lord of host was with him does anybody remember how this tells us about the army the lord of hosts it also could be translated the Lord of army, armies. And it's talking about the host of heaven, which are angels. So he's got this great army. And if you wondered if they thought about him having a great army, 1 Chronicles 12 and 22 tells us. It says, For at that time they came to David day by day to help him until it was a great army. So his army was growing like the army of God. Why did David want an army like the army of God? Who's going to defeat God's army? And how great is this army? 
You know, they're all under God's command. And certainly as they think about the God's power, and then he has his whole army behind him as well. But you know, as we read in Revelation, whenever Jesus returns, and you know, there's the battle of Armageddon, and those angels, that host of heaven, that army is coming with him. Do they do anything to destroy that army? It's Jesus by the word of his mouth. So God doesn't even need an army, but he has an army. He, has, he is the Lord of hosts, the Lord of armies, the Lord of these, these angels, these heavenly beings. Going further, how can we know anything about heaven? We've talked about special revelation. There's a bunch of different references in 1 Chronicles I mentioned there. But this particular one is 1 Chronicles 16 and 15. And they're thinking about the covenant. Again, the people are back in the land, and they're thinking about what has God promised? Now, the covenant is a special revelation of God, is it not? God came to the people, revealed himself to the people, revealed what it is to be in a relationship with him. It says, remember his covenant forever. The Lord, I mean, the word which he commanded for a thousand generations. So God has given them by his word a special revelation that they may know how they can have a relationship with them. Now, certainly that has got great connections to heaven. For how can we be in heaven, but we must have a relationship with God. We must enter into a covenant agreement with God. Now, this old covenant they had in the Mosaic Law, again, they had their sacrifices and all these things that were always pointing to Jesus, the new covenant. And in the new covenant, we don't do the sacrifices over and over again because Jesus has been that final sacrifice, completely sufficient for all of our sins. And everything that we see in the Old Covenant, again, just points to Jesus and His perfection. And now as we look at God's Word, we need to be reminded again what it is to have a relationship with Him. First, you have to turn to Jesus to be saved. You must know that you're a sinner and you must repent. Turn to Jesus for salvation. And he puts a call upon our lives of how we are to live our lives. Just like the old covenant, put a call upon the people's lives. This is what it is to be a holy people. Let's not forget that, church. God calls us to be holy. We can't just sign a card and say, I accept Jesus and that's the end of the story. We need to be holy people. Now, our works do not save us, but as a reflection of the change that comes. So God has given us this special revelation that we may know Him, that we may be saved, that we may live with Him forever, that we may be a holy people. Uh, the final question we have with the other Jewish beliefs. So the tabernacle and the temple, they were God's special dwelling place on earth. So the tabernacle, if you remember, this is the tent that was moved in the wilderness. The tabernacle stood in, in David's day. And then the temple was built in Solomon's day. And the tabernacle and temple both had the Ark of the Covenant in those days as well, and those Holy of Holies. And they, they definitely viewed it as this is God's special dwelling place on earth. His uh, Shekinah glory, this cloud of smoke that was over the temple that would move when they were in the wilderness, and it was in that special Holy of Holies. So this is First Chronicles 16 and 1. And they're trying to move the ark of God. So they brought the ark of God and set it in the midst of the tabernacle that David had erected for it. And then they offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before God. So this is the conclusion of a matter that didn't go as well initially because they tried to move the ark without listening to God's word. How many times have we messed up in our own lives because we just didn't listen to God's plain word? I mean, he told us what to do. Why are we not listening? Well, they finally listen, and they take the ark of God into the tabernacle. Why was the ark not where it needed to be in the first place? So the people really looked at it as this kind of a magic thing, or like a magic box. I mean, that, that's the whole theme of the Indiana Jones movie, is that the ark's got some kind of magic power to it. Who's got the power? God. It wasn't that piece of furniture. God had blessed them by giving his presence to them with that ark. And they tried to use it to, at their own will. 
Oh, how many times do we try to use God at our own will? Try to make him do things. You can't make God do anything at all. But they, know, they realize again, if we're going to have peace in the land, pray, we need God's presence here. So they finally do what they need to do to bring the ark to the tabernacle that uh, David had erected for it. Going a little bit further, they definitely had an understanding that God will judge the earth. I mean, they'd seen it in small judgments as people were killed for their sin. they have seen it in bigger as their nations were judged. And I mean, again, this is the people looking back after the exile. They realized God was serious, you know, when he sent all those prophets and said, you need to repent or Babylon's going to take you away. And guess what happened? Babylon took them away just as he had promised. So they realized God will judge the earth. I remember, yeah, you remember how he's taken away to Babylon and I've come back to the land now. And he's promised he's going to be judging the whole earth. So this is First Chronicles 16, 31 through 33. Let the heavens rejoice. Now that time, that could be call, calling upon creation as a whole, and I think it probably is because we got earth next. Or it could be saying the heavens as in God's dwelling place too. But it's a call for praise. Let the heavens rejoice and let the earth be glad and let them say among the nations, the Lord reigns. We can say hallelujah to that. <laughs> that is why... The people could celebrate. It's good news. The Lord reigns. He is in control. The kingdom come. Verse 32. Let the sea roar in all its fullness. Let the field rejoice in all that is in it. Then the trees of the woods shall rejoice before the Lord. So all of creation is praising the Lord. And here's what they say about the Lord reigning. This is why all of creation is celebrating. For he is coming to judge the earth. And that seems like an interesting end to it, doesn't it? Why should they be celebrating that he's coming to judge the earth? We realize that even all of the earth, even all of creation, is groaning because of the fall. God is coming to judge sin, to put away the curse, and one day there will be that new heaven and that new earth. That is a reason to rejoice. And God was coming to judge his enemies. And again, as Israel was reflecting upon the things they had done wrong in the past, they recognize it's good to know God. It's good to be on His side, for He reigns and He's coming to judge the earth. Another verse from that is First Six, uh, First Chronicles sixteen, fourteen through eighteen. He is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. Now that doesn't necessarily just mean judgment as in the end times or judging the wicked, but that His rule. So His judgments are in all the earth. Remember His covenant forever the word which he commanded for a thousand generations, the covenant which he made with Abraham and his oath to Isaac and confirmed it to Jacob for a statute, to Israel for an everlasting covenant, saying, to you I will give the land of Canaan as the allotment of your inheritance. You know, they're just looking back again. They're back in the Holy Land, but it's not like it used to be. But they remember the reason that we're even here is because of God's faithfulness. It's because of the covenant that he's promised it's because he is a righteous judge and God is in control. So even when these the people were in foreign lands in Persia, God was in control and God allowed them to be able to return back to the land. His judgments, his rule is over all of the earth. Talking about the ark once again, this is 1 Chronicles 13 and 6. God dwelt between the cherubim of the ark. Now what, what's cherubim? What are those? Anybody know? Angels. A certain type of angel. Have you ever thought about this before, that every angel is its own species in a way? Because the angels don't procreate. So every angel that's created, God created as a special creation. Every single one of them. But then we have these descriptions of different types of angels, cherubim and seraphim, and we have the archangels as well. These cherubim are particularly pictured as covering God's feet and this holiness. So on the ark, the way it was designed, they had the two cherubim. They were sewed into the curtains, actually, the Holy of Holies as well. Lots of imagery of, of these angels. So they're bowing down and they're covering over the lid of the ark. So this says, uh, 1 Chronicles 13 and 6, 
And David and all Israel went up to Bala, to Kirjath Jerim, which belonged to Judah, to bring up from there the ark of God the Lord, who dwells between the cherubim, where his name is proclaimed. I mean, they're still kind of looking at the ark as we're, we're carrying God with us to, to bring him back. And this is the beginning of what didn't work out well at first. But they're looking at the ark of God and they saying he's dwelling between the cherubim. Now this lid of the ark was really the footstool of God, was the imagery they, they understood. So God is in heaven. He's, you know, transcendent. He's away. And God's feet are coming down to earth and they're resting on this footstool of the ark and these cherubim are covering his feet so that's the imagery they have of god's presence there the god in heaven is coming down to the earth and i love as we think about this picture too so you remember the ark of the covenant was used so why was it called the ark of the covenant it's because inside was the ten commandments the covenant and as they did the day of atonement They'd go into this Holy of Holies and they would sprinkle the blood on this lid, on the top of it. Now think about this imagery of God being in heaven, God looking down at this ark below him, and the blood is covering the law that has been broken. Is that not a beautiful picture of what Christ's blood does for us? As, as God looks upon us, we are not judged for that law that we have broken because the blood covers the covenant. It covers the law that was broken. Again, what a beautiful image of God looking down and seeing that sacrifice recovered by the blood of Christ. Going further with the ark, so here's the bad scenario. And I feel bad for Uzzah. <laughs> Uzzah just kind of doing what, you know, what any of us probably would think about doing as they're moving the ark on a cart when they weren't supposed to. And really, David was at fault for this as well. But this is First Chronicles 13, 9 through 10. And we see in this that a person should not approach holy God presumptuously. You can't just run up upon God. God's got to allow you to come to Him on His terms. And we're dirty people. We are not holy of our own. That's why we need Christ, His holiness to cover us. But in this one, 1 Chronicles 13, 9 through 10. And when they came to Chidon's threshing floor, Uzzah put out his hand to hold the ark. Perhaps he thought when, this cart's, when this, the oxen stumble, so this is for the oxen stumble, maybe he thought, my hand is at least not as dirty as that ground. He's trying to save this ark from falling down. And he reaches up, and it says, Then the anger of the Lord was aroused against Uzzah, and he struck him because he put his hand to the ark, and he died there before God. Again, we see that God is serious about holiness. And Uzzah was unclean. He was doing something that God had told the people not to do. Don't touch the ark. If you remember, they had the poles that the priests were supposed to carry the ark with. And on the Day of Atonement, it was said that the high priest would have bells on their, on their garment and they would tie a rope to them. And if the bells stopped jingling, they knew that they were dead and they would drag them out. I don't know of any uh, recorded occurrence of that happening. Can you imagine the, how fearful the high priests were on that Day of Atonement? You got a rope on you and bells because... If you approach God in a way that you shouldn't, you're going to die. It may be. There's a lot of little phrases like that come from biblical accounts. Well, you remember whenever God appeared on the mountain and Moses was there, the people were fearful of His presence. They realized. And even when Moses saw the burning bush before that, as he approached him, God says, take off your feet. I mean, your, your sandals, not your feet. <laughs> Take off your sandals for this ground you're standing on is holy. Are we really running up to God dirty? Well, not if we're in Christ. If we go to Hebrews, it says that we can boldly approach the throne of grace. Why is that? Because of Jesus. Because of Jesus. It's a whole new day, isn't it? In this new covenant, we are a holy people. 
But listen, we need to continue to listen to what God says it is to be holy. We need to sanctify ourselves by the power of the Holy Spirit. We need to be obedient to Him. We need to be pleasing to Him. Not thinking that God's going to bless us when we are disobedient. God's holiness is a serious thing. And that was something that Israel understood. But man, Israel, they were stiff-necked. Man, we're stiff-necked today. There's stiff-necked people all around. There's so many people that want God in their way, but not in God's way. And when Jesus says, take up that cross and follow me, He really means it. Make a sacrifice. Be holy because God is holy. The people needed to be clean to approach holy God. And this is 1 Chronicles 15 and 14. So the priests and the Levites sanctified themselves to bring up the ark of the Lord God of Israel. So Uzzah had not sanctified himself. He had not set himself apart for holiness. He had not cleansed himself. He wasn't doing what God had told him to do, and he died. But now we have the Levites and the priests, and they sanctify themselves. And you remember the rituals of them bathing even when they, were, they had the temple built as well. They had to be clean before they came and served in the temple. And they needed to be sanctified. They needed to be set apart for holiness to bring up the ark of the Lord God of Israel. Going a little bit further, the presence of God brings blessings to the faithful. Again, why is heaven a great place, a wonderful place? Because God's presence. When was Israel blessed? It was when God's presence was with them as a faithful people. Now, this is still in this story of the ark. It's 1 Chronicles 13, 13 through 14. It says, So God would not move the ark with So David would not move the ark with him into the city of David, but took it aside into the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite. So Uzzah has died, and David's like, we can't take it. (laughs) Let's just put it over that guy's house. Can you imagine Obed-Edom? He's like, "Um, guys, I'm not real sure about this. (laughs) You're putting that in my house. But verse 14 says, The ark of God remained the family of Obed-Edom in his house three months, and the Lord blessed the house of of Obed-Edom and all that he had. There's no doubt that Obed-Edom was faithful. He didn't go over there and touch the ark. He's like, you know, I wonder how close I can get. No, he respected God. And no doubt he had a healthy fear about that ark being there. But God's presence with him, what happened? It blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that he had. And again, heaven is a blessing and all that we will have because of God's presence. And God gives a person rest. You know, as the people looked at the promised land to come before they entered into the promised land of Jerusalem, as we looked at the promised land now, it's often thought of as as a rest. Do you ever want rest? Do you ever just feel worn out? Not just physically, but mentally, spiritually as well. God offers rest. And this is an idea that just was always in, in the people's mind. First Chronicles 23 and 25. For David said, The Lord God of Israel has given rest to his people, that they may dwell in Jerusalem forever. What was this rest that David was talking about? Are they having to fight anymore? No. They're safe in the land, right? In the Holy Land. And as we look at this with Jerusalem, as we look at this with the people of Uh, with Israel, we just see these little pictures of of what heaven is going to be. For we will have rest. There will be no enemies against us at all. And we will dwell with God in holy Jerusalem forever. And how great to think that we never have to worry about any enemies. You know, sometimes people have enemies on a personal level. Maybe it's family. Maybe it's people that are in a community that are opposed to them in some way. Then you think about the national level. I mean, there's always this threat of nuclear war and wars. and You know, Jesus says there's going to be wars and rumors of wars. But be of good cheer because he's overcome the world. We don't have to worry because rest truly does await those who are in Christ. God gives a person rest. So God's work in 1 Chronicles, we see that there is an army in heaven that God's presence dwelt in a special way in the tabernacle, temple above the ark. The presence of God brings blessings to the faithful. And God will judge the earth. 
God is in control of life and death. And we'll actually see that a little bit more detailed in the next lesson in First Chronicles. Human life should be respected. That is the truth of the bodies as well. Salvation is of the Lord. And a person should not approach holy God presumptuously. The people need to be clean to approach holy God. As such, sins must be atoned. And certainly, that's where the people today must come to a realization. People are making excuses for their sins today. Making excuses for their lifestyles and their choices. Saying that they were just born that way. They're just following their heart. And you know it's true. The Bible tells us our heart is a liar. Then it's wicked. And Jesus says we must be born again. We have a problem. And it's sin. See that throughout the Old Testament. See that throughout the New Testament. God's going to judge sin. And He either judges the sin on us or on Christ. For all those that are in Christ, that blood covers that law that has been broken. And what a beautiful, beautiful truth that is. Anybody have anything to add or questions? So next time we'll look at the rest of 1 Chronicles, be chapter 17 through 29. Probably 2 Chronicles probably divided up a couple times as well. And then we'll be looking at that 400 years of silence and see kind of what was developing in Israel in between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we, we thank you that you are good and that you are merciful. We thank you for warning us of our sins, Lord. Thank you for bringing us conviction. Thank you for your Holy Spirit, Lord. Thank you for your Son who shed his precious blood that our sins may be atoned, that we may be a holy people. And Father, as we stand in Christ today, we know that we are justified, that we are found not guilty because Christ has taken our sins upon him and given us his holiness, his standing. And Father, we know that's not the end of holiness. For now, you currently sanctify us by your Holy Spirit, Lord. You make us into a holy people. You call us to be holy, for you are holy, Lord. Help us to be obedient to all that you have commanded, that we would be pleasing to you, Lord, that we would be a light to the nations. And Father, we thank you that our good works are not what saves us. We know that it is only by the sacrifice of Christ, the sinless life of Christ, that we are saved. But our good works, Lord, reflect what you have done inside. Our good works reflect who you desire us to be. And our good works reflect who we will be completely one day, Lord. We thank you for the resurrection to come where one day we will be glorified completely. And then we will have rest. We will not have to fear enemies at all, Lord. And we know that that last enemy to be destroyed is death. We thank you for that great truth, Lord. And we rejoice in you. We thank you and we love you. In the holy name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.